even if there is something about pregnancy loss, it's usually, or infant loss, it's usually like a tiny paragraph or a Mm -hmm. footnote. And when I had my first miscarriage, I remember just being like, what happened? What now? What? Mm -hmm. Like so many questions. And the first thing I could think of was a girlfriend that I know from when I was living in San Francisco who had posted a, a video of her experience. And I remember pouring love into her and just saying, I'm so sorry you went through that. And um, and then, you know, life goes on as it does. Welcome to the Let's Not Sugar Quoted podcast, where every week we bring you real, raw and unfiltered conversations designed to motivate and inspire you on your journey through motherhood, relationships and career. We're your hosts, Alex and Bella. Thanks for spending this time with us. Let's get into it. Welcome. Let's get into it, ladies. So today we have Journey Hencart back in studio. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Yes. Thanks for We're so excited to have you back. back. And for those of you who don't know Journey, she's a public speaker, an author, a breathwork facilitator. And what else does your lovely array Oh my gosh, so much. Oh, she's like, does this amazing networking (laughs) event. She's a mom (laughs) of this adorable baby boy, not a baby anymore, but named Jax. She's a wife. She's a world traveler. Mm-hmm. So she's been welcome. on opera. She just got back from Mexico and she's briefly coming to see us before <laughs> she goes to Bali. <laughs> nice. So yes, yeah. we are so excited to have you. Well, yes. thanks for having me back. Yes. And today we are going to be talking about a topic that's kind of heavy on the heart because I feel like we do not as women uh, talk about uh, pregnancy loss, um, infertility, Mm. Um, miscarriages. miscarriages and yeah, infant loss uh, enough. We tend to suffer in silence and I feel like we should start the conversation because having women rally around, you know, somebody who's going through a rough time is so important for the healing and just, yeah, not to be so isolated because it's already such a difficult time. So Journey's here to talk about her loss that she recently went through. And um, yeah, we wanted to kind of get into it so she can start that conversation with us. Yeah, Yeah. and it's a hard one to have. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But I also feel like it is important and I'm still in it. Mm -hmm. I've had three losses now. Mm -hmm. Um, And I realize not a lot of people do talk about it, even though it is so common. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, thank you for opening the space. Um, it's something that so many people do suffer in silence. A lot of people feel like they have to do it alone or it's just it's just too sad to bring up to other people. You know, you don't want to be a bummer around your friends. Mm-hmm. But when so many people are dealing with it, it's like, well we can give courage to each other to get through it Mm -hmm. together. Yeah. And I think it's such a stigma too, for some reason, not to talk about pregnancy loss and miscarriage. And I know we were saying that before we started where we always give away our good material, but (laughs) a friend had said once when, you know, I had said to someone, you know, sorry for your loss. And she was like, you don't talk about pregnancy loss. It's just not a thing. And I was like, wait, have you ever lost a baby? And she said, no, but it's not something people talk about. And I was like, no, this is the problem. You're the problem here. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that is the problem. We don't talk about, we think it's taboo to talk about it for some reason in society. Yeah. I'm yeah. not sure. It's, it's, I don't know it, why. It, yeah. And then keeping everything a secret, right? Like I, I get it. There's a, I feel like we don't celebrate just the fact of getting pregnant. We keep that to ourselves because... For the reason, if you lose a baby, we don't want to spread the joy, but then we don't talk about the loss. Like it's such a weird concept to me. I do not understand it Mm. where I got pregnant. Let's say it took me four years to get pregnant and I let my friends, not everybody, obviously, but my closest family and friends know that, hey, we finally got pregnant. Is there going to be, you know, a rough because I was pregnant with triplets and We did lose one baby early on, but, you know, still we had people who rallied around and we we shared in the joy of life. Mm. And then we also shared in, you know, the sadness of the loss of the life, 
right? But I was surrounded by those around me and my journey wasn't alone. So for me, huge. yeah, for me, like no, this whole concept, do not tell them, you know, until your three, my first trimester, I'm like, why? Because, like, why? Why not share in in the joy and in, in the sorrow, mm-hmm. you know? Well, and I think it's, Harshly because, well, and and it's huge that you had that community because Mm -hmm. that is what I feel like helps a lot of people to get through it and to share both sides of it. But I think in, you know, in the past, everyone did everything more in silence Mm -hmm. or on their own. It was, um, you know, people wore big baggy clothes when they were pregnant, whereas now, you know, women will wear, yeah, more fitted clothes and show off that beautiful belly and in um you know when pe- when women lost babies and lost pregnancies they it, it was quiet it was mm-hmm. you know now a lot more people are talking about just the ups and downs of life in general mm-hmm. and giving more space to talk about grief and mental health and there's just more space for it so i do think times are changing now more mm-hmm. where we can talk about it we don't have to hide what's happening. Um, I think also I did do a post or um, a poll in my stories a a few months ago. And I said, why don't people talk about it more? Mm -hmm. Why do you think? And so people had all different things to share of, of what was personal for them or what they thought for people. And a lot of it were things like shame Mm -hmm. and guilt you know, the feeling that there's something wrong with the mother, even though we can say as much as there isn't, I think a lot of us still go through that. What did Mm -hmm. I do wrong? What am I not doing? What am I missing? Mm -hmm. Um, So that shame and guilt that there's something wrong, that the the mother did something. Then there's also just the feelings that if we're still in it, maybe we haven't figured out the words to express it and explain what's happening, especially to people who haven't gone through it themselves. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the list went on of just, you know, fear. What are people going to say? Will there be judgment? Will there be unsolicited advice and comments? I was on a um, grief, a pregnancy loss grief support group recently. And one of the one of the women was sharing a lot of things that her family was saying mm-hmm. to her about what she did wrong. I mean, everything from like, you didn't pray enough because they're religious and, mm. you know, certain things. So having that uh, unsolicited advice can be really unwelcome. Mm-hmm. So there's so many reasons I think people sometimes fear talking about it and it's vulnerable. I mean, I just noticed walking in the door today that all of a sudden I got emotional when I didn't really think I would, but it is a, a vulnerable talk topic to mm-hmm. talk about, especially if, you know, I'm still in it, I'm still mm-hmm. in the thick of it and, mm-hmm. and in, you know, wanting to conceive. So mm-hmm. figuring it out as I go one day at a time, you know, mm-hmm. totally. So do you want to share yeah. your story? Um, like what? Do I want to? Yeah. Well, no, will but you will so you graciously share? share? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Let's take a sip of water. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I do feel like talking about it is important. Um, Going down that memory lane is freaking scary and hard. And, you know, the whole point of, I love the title of your podcast, you know, it's not about sugarcoating it. And so I was thinking this morning, okay, how much do I tell? What do people want to hear? What do they not want to hear? But maybe that's what people need to hear. So we'll just go with it and I'll see what comes out and obviously Mm -hmm. what questions you have. Um, But this last year I've had three losses. Mm -hmm. I did, oh gosh, it, um, it's crazy. You become part of this club you don't want to become part of, you mm-hmm. know? I never thought this would be my story, but I, we got pregnant pretty quickly with um, the first loss and, do you know, just didn't think of it, anything of it because the first, my pregnancy with our son just was smooth and went well and I had a little bit of spotting. I did go to the hospital for that with him, but everything was fine. And mm-hmm. so this time got pregnant, everything was good. Um, and then I was actually supposed to go up to Predator Ridge with a bunch of girlfriends for an annual yearly thing we had. And I was spotting the day before, but I thought, okay, spotting happens. Talk, I was talking to my midwife. It was day two of spotting. Mm-hmm. And... I 
was, yeah, my midwife said, yeah, you probably shouldn't go up there. I was be, about to be picked up like 10 minutes mm -hmm. from being picked up. And she said, no, I think you should go to the ER and go get checked. And about five minutes after that call, I told my husband and I was, I hadn't even gotten my thoughts together of like, okay, I need to grab a sweater. Like all of a sudden it was just clearly leaving mm -hmm. my body. And that's something I think that we're just not prepped for. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. I was talking to my husband this morning and we we're kind of going over some of the things. And he said, as a guy, he just thought, you know, you take a, a pregnancy test and one day you're just, you know, for, if you're having a miscarriage, you're just not pregnant anymore. Mm -hmm. He had no idea what happens. And if I think about it, neither did I. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. But um, all of a sudden it was like, you know... If, if someone ever says it's like the worst period you've ever had, it, it multiply that by a thousand. Mm. It was frightening. Like I thought I was maybe hemorrhaging. I didn't know if I should go to the ER, but I couldn't leave the bathroom. Like mm -hmm. there was no leaving. And this realization of what it meant mm. was absolutely horrific. Like, you know, like the second you get that positive pregnancy test it's like counting like okay when does that mean that they're gonna be born and what does that look like and count like just visualizing a life with like you know our family and in that moment of like what that meant mm -hmm. it was it was just really like heartbreaking mm -hmm. and at the same time seeing what is leaving my body it was just like frightening mm -hmm. And then, you know, we weren't prepped for it. So our three-year-old is there and we were just trying to, I mean, there was the shock and, and all of that. So yeah, um, wasn't prepared in any capacity, um, to get to the, my bed, to be able to just lie down in between these like flushes, I guess, for lack of a better word, um, uh, the only thing I could think of was grabbing one of my son's diapers, mm -hmm. which is really not glamorous. But in a moment of, you know, what are you going to do? There was mm -hmm. nothing else that would, you know, anyways. So, yeah, um, I never, yeah, it was, it was, it was a lot. And so I, and then the level of cramping, mm -hmm. um, that went on for a couple hours. And then there was this probably about three hours later. There was this probably 45 minute to an hour window where it was it was very too similar to labor mm. where I was in the bathroom and I was just hot and cramping and like my stomach, my uh, uterus was having contractions. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it uh, it was again and, this, and then just the sadness of like this isn't the right time for contractions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's all the sides to it. There's the physical side, there's the hormones, there's the, the, just sh the realization of what's happening. Then there's like, my poor son is just like, mommy, what, you know, you know and, so sad, mm -hmm. mommy. Yeah. Yeah, and we don't have family that lives in town. My mom is in California. So it's not like I could, I mean, she's so nurturing and I know she would have been there in a heartbeat if she could. And so, yeah, we were just going through it. Mm hmm did you at any point think of like reaching out to you? Because you said you're going with your girlfriends, mm -hmm. you know, at any point to reach out and be like, hey, I need help. Like I need. Yeah. I mean, they were already, I, I, myself and this one, and one of our other friends were the last two to join. So they were already up there. Mm -hmm. um, I know it was hard on them too. And they were so sweet after when they came back. I mean, and, and there were a few friends that were here, you know, in different friend groups that we did tell and mm -hmm. that was that meant everything people would stop by with and it was like a we'll leave something at the door if you don't want you know mm -hmm. um if you don't want the company but people brought flowers and ice cream and meals and I did ha I did feel very very loved and supported mm -hmm. which I'm very grateful for mm. yeah yeah wow and then did you have to, after that first loss, did you have to go to a DNC or anything like that? Or 
No, everything expelled. Mm -hmm. And um, I was bleeding for a while. And then I had to take another HCG test, which is the pregnancy hormone to see if I was still pregnant. And so they check every couple of days. I have to go in for um, blood work. Mm -hmm. And as long as it was going down, down, down. And then when it was zero, we knew that everything was gone because if that hormone level stays up, then it shows that there's something still in there. So mm-hmm. luckily I didn't have to go with for a DNC. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's kind of interesting that, you know, when we're doing um pregnancy prep, right? They teach you you go to classes and you know you're you're always prepping for the birth. You know, nobody talks about the loss yeah. and the potential of so we have so many resources. You know, you go to pregnancy yoga and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, when I was trying to get pregnant, I had four years of, and it's a completely different story because with in vitro, but I did feel like I needed to educate myself on the, you know, the, the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Risk of having multiples. Mm. And prior to... I felt off and I'm like, you know, a lot of twins end up in NICU because they're born early. So I took it upon myself to go to the hospital that I was going to be delivering and going and talking to the nurses and checking out the NICU and talking to them to see, just to see, so that their shock of if I had to end up in there wasn't so great, right? Because you do see different types of babies, the size of it and, you know, and you know, mother's intuitive, whatever you want to call it, intuition. I did end up, you know, in the NICU with my babies because they did come really early. They were born at three and four pounds and then dropped down. So they were little, little tiny things. But I already had that familiar, um, familiarity of the space I was going to be in. But if I didn't take that upon myself, I wouldn't have known. Right? Yeah, like and nobody told you like, go check it out. Yeah, and nobody, it's the same thing. It's nobody talks about the possibility and how common it is to have miscarriages. And we don't know as women going in, going, hey, our first might be a difficult to get pregnant. No, maybe our first one was easy. Now our second is we're having difficulty and now we're having multiple miscarriages and loss and all that kind of stuff. We don't have that education. We're not prepped. It's all, yeah. let's mm-hmm. do, you know, the breath work and the yoga yeah. and focus on the positive, the do- which is yeah. usually my Maybe. MO. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I do feel there should be some sort of, you know, our, you know, real, raw and unfiltered conversations. This is pregnancy. Mm-hmm. This is what could and might mm-hmm. happen because then we're prepared. You know, and I, I felt a lot better prepared than some of the other women that were coming into NICU and the the shock and the grief and all that kind of stuff, right? So, and yeah, the loss of those babies as well, because not every preemie makes it. Mm-hmm. So I was lucky enough that my babies, you know, survived mm-hmm. um, being born so little, you know? So, yeah, I do feel like, you know, you're doing great because you're talking about it. Mm -hmm. You're sharing your story. And within that, us women get educated because it's not there. It's just not there. Yeah. And even if it's just tabling it, you know, I mean, even if there is something about pregnancy loss, it's usually, or infant loss, it's usually like a tiny paragraph or Mm -hmm. a footnote. And when I had my first miscarriage, I remember just being like, what happened? What now? What? Mm -hmm. Like so many questions. And the first thing I could think of was a girlfriend that I know from when I was living in San Francisco who had posted a a video of her experience. And I remember pouring love into her and just saying, I'm so sorry you went through that. And, um, And then, you know, life goes on as it does. And so in that moment when I was just in bed a mess, I went back to her video. I scrolled until I found it watched the whole thing again. And then I reached out to her and that started my path of discovery of what is out there, what does exist. And there are now more Instagram accounts and people Mm -hmm. sharing and people, you know, talking more about their, their losses, which I think is just an important turn 
in society right now, to your point, so that people know that they're not alone. And of course, we don't want to focus on the scary and the sad when we're in a place of positivity and newness, but knowing where to go if, and hopefully not when, but if something were to happen, Mm -hmm. having those resources at hand or so, or people, you know, to go to, I I do think are so important. Mm -hmm. I think too, like, even if we could prep people before they tried to get pregnant, you know what I mean? Because I had a friend, a doctor friend, and then a friend who, um, worked in like prenatal stuff. And she was like, well, one of the problems is when people are pregnant as she's like, and you know, you might've experienced this as a mom, when you get pregnant, you're all of a sudden, like you're saying, you start thinking of this baby, you're worried about everything. Right. And she's like, sometimes talking about loss in that moment brings people to like an anxious level, which isn't helpful anyway to them or anybody. Right. And so she's like, but there should be a way for us to talk about it where we're like, you know, like you're saying, Bella, like, these are the things that might happen or this is a common thing. I think it's too, like you were talking about at the beginning, there is that shame that people have, like, what did I do or what could I have done differently? Or you go backwards and you think about it, right? I you know we were at this wedding once in um, uh, Australia and a friend of ours, they had been trying to get pregnant for years and she was like, fuck this. I'm, I can't get pregnant. She ate so many oysters on that trip. And then she came back, found out she was pregnant and then lost this baby. And all she thought about oh. for months was that it's because I ate oysters. It's because I did this. And she put so much blame on herself. And that's what we do sometimes, right? We're like, ah, oh, it's us. It's something we've done. It's hard not but to. But you had all these stats mm-hmm. about all the losses and there's so many. Yeah, well, one in four... Women have miscarriages and it it could be more than that because there isn't a real way of reporting them. So that's about 15,000 miscarriages in just in BC, Um, about 500 stillbirths a year in BC and about 200 infant deaths per Mm -hmm. year. Um, Also one in six people experience some sort of infertility. And Mm -hmm. so people are going through a lot of different things and at different times and at different levels and it is it is it is really hard it can be hard on the families it can be hard on relationships mm-hmm. you know sometimes we forget that the husbands are going through it too mm-hmm. that's so true you know they experience they experienced a loss in mm-hmm. a very different way but they did and and of course everyone deals with things differently I'm so grateful that my husband's just been incredibly supportive. And Mm. during my losses, he has just taken on every parenting role for our son. So I didn't have to, and I could just be depressed in bed for as long as I needed. Um, And, you know, sometimes guys are maybe, maybe it's a stereotype. Some people, I'll just say some people, because it can be the the Mm -hmm. women too sometimes. Some Mm -hmm. people are just better at putting, no, I don't know if it's better is the right word, but some people put things away. They put mm-hmm. things on the shelf. They put their emotions aside and just move forward. And that can be hard for the other partner who mm-hmm. might want to feel more or talk about it more. Mm-hmm. And so I think, yeah, having conversations within the partnership on mm-hmm. both sides of how are you feeling? And, and that can change also, right? Mm-hmm. One, I mean, the first month I felt like I was still in it. I still had to check my pregnancy hormones, make sure that I wasn't, uh, you know, going in the wrong direction. And then also my hormones are just completely off. And then, you know, month two, it sort sort of starts to sink in, in a different way. And then, you know, and then even a year, well, nine months later, then it's like, oh, this is when baby was going to come. And mm-hmm. so some people have ceremonies and rituals or celebrations around that time of of year for their, you know, the baby that didn't make it. There's so many different ways of honoring the space and the time and the situation and just really recognizing that it can be different for everyone involved, but that everyone involved is feeling it in some way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do feel like when I was going through infertility and taking all the drugs and like all the procedures and everything that I had to do, um, Lee was very supportive, but he felt so helpless. Right. Right. Yeah. Because he, to him, he's the provider, he's the fixer. He wants to make sure I'm okay. But 
it's out of his control. So all he could do is hold space and, you know, deal with all my emotions. emotions. (laughs) (laughs) And And I could go through them within a 20 minute span from laughing to crying to anger to Mm -hmm. sadness and he just asked that I don't kill him and that's all (laughs) his sleep just Just don't kill me in my sleep that was one of the hardest things for Ian too Mm -hmm. he said you know seeing me hurting so bad and not being able to help Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah they do feel helpless I do you know not everybody but you know some men when they do want to support and 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 be there but they do a good job by just being there in the ways like you said, you could be in bed and, you know, mm-hmm. Ian took care of the son. So, yeah. you know, that is that support that we really need um, when we have an amazing partner that, you know, is there with us mm-hmm. through it all. Yeah. Yeah. And the holidays can be really hard for mm-hmm. people too, because, you know, family come together and start asking questions mm-hmm. or yeah. or try to avoid questions yeah. because they don't know if it's a touchy subject. Do they want to talk about it? Do they not? Mm-hmm. So I've become that person that just blurts it out for yeah. everybody. I'll just talk about it so <laughs> that it's not the elephant in the room. Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, but this year is going to be a little bit tricky because this... So, so we talked about the first mm-hmm. loss. The second one, we... I had one period, regular period, and then we got pregnant again. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, Googling, oh yeah, you're, you know, a high chance of getting pregnant again right away. So let's get on that. So got pregnant. And then around the holidays, the wife, we found out that it wasn't going to grow into a baby before, I don't even know how to, like, how do you talk about it? Mm -hmm. Anyway, we knew it wasn't going to happen before Christmas, but I had to choose, do I want a DNC or just let it, Mm -hmm. um, you know, go natural? And I thought, well, I'll just see what happens. Mm -hmm. We went away, we went to Vancouver for the holidays and over Christmas, I had to just be waiting Mm -hmm. to see what my body was going to do. Mm -hmm. It was so awful. And just the feeling of like, something is in my body, but it is not alive and it is not Mm -hmm. growing. Yeah. And like everyone's cheery and it's, you know, I love Christmas. I love the holidays. I love celebrating. And I was just, like, I was like, how do I have conversations with people when this is what's happening inside my body? Mm-hmm. And also not wanting to bring everybody down, not wanting to be, you know, just a ball of tears the whole time. And so I really... Honestly, it's a bit of a blur last year. I don't really remember how much I showed up or how much I hid in another room. I Mm -hmm. just don't really remember. Um, But then I remember coming home after Christmas and it was two days before New Year's that everything released. Mm -hmm. And happy freaking New Year. (laughs) It was hard. It was a really, really hard time. And that really broke me. Mm-hmm. Um, two in a row that close together, hormones out of whack, uh, two losses now. I felt very, very, very broken for many months. Mm-hmm. And I did. I lost myself in work. I like started doing more events and go, go, go. I started drinking a little more wine and, mm-hmm. you know, coping the best ways I could. Um, and I, th- I don't think anyone from the outside would have known except for the people I was talking to about it, but I felt very broken. And so it took about six months for my, everything to kind of balance my hormones, my period, everything was out of whack for a while. And so we started trying again about seven or eight months later. Um, you know, it took a month or two, got pregnant again. And I, and this was crazy because at this point it was exactly a year later from the first one. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, this one's going to stick. It's a year later. Like they're Mm -hmm. trying, you know, maybe it's the same baby spirit again. And they're like, okay, one year later. Now we're ready. You're ready. (laughs) I'm ready. Oh, I had all the reasons why this one was going to be the one. And so much happened at the same time. We were evacuated from the fires because there were two fires, four minutes from our house. Um, got evacuated. The next day, my husband had to leave for a month for a big project that there that basically doesn't happen without him and one other person. So he mm-hmm. had to go. It was not a question. And it was already planned. And and there I was, you know, had just found out or yeah, newly pregnant. 
and my life was upside down. Mm. So my, I took my son, we went to my mom's in California and I found out my HCG levels were lower than they liked, but they said it could turn around. And so I had this, it was a, it was a short window, but I had this like save the baby plan, mm-hmm. which I realize now probably was not good for my mental health, but I was like doing all the things and listening to all the, you know, connect with your baby and Mm. making sure I was doing great with all my prenatals. And I was just so committed that this one was going to stick and it didn't. Mm. And I was, and my, I wasn't with my husband during that either. Thank goodness. I was with my mom and she took such good care of me and my son. Thank goodness. Um, but then I felt broken on top of broken Mm. and I feel like I came back a different person. I've luckily been in um, quite a bit of grief therapy. Um, there's some really great support groups that offer free free group counseling for um, people going through pregnancy loss. And yeah, it it <laughs> sometimes you know hearing other people's stories who are going through it and hurting at the same time. Like you don't want other people to hurt, but it just it makes me feel like I'm not alone in something that feels so isolating. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you know, I go through waves when, you know, I'll go through a period of time where I'm good and everything feels fine. And then I'll just, something will trigger and I'll just start crying. And Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, I have been very surprised by my own level of sadness around it all. Before having any losses, I never could understand why people would be so connected to something that wasn't even fully formed yet, Mm -hmm. right? And I didn't get it. And now, gosh, I get it on a degree I never wanted to. But Mm -hmm. it is, it's it's when you see that positive pregnancy and I start visualizing, you know, Mm -hmm. all the things and and then the hormones get you connected to the little bundle that's going to come and for all of that to just be stripped away. Mm. Um. Yeah, so it has been, I do feel like I'm rebuilding now. I'm I'm talking about it, which I do mm-hmm. feel like is healing. I cry about it when I need to. When people ask me how I'm doing, when I see them out, I am honest, you know? Mm-hmm. I just say, look, well, the truth is I've been struggling with pregnancy losses and it's been really hard, but, you know, we're working on it. And, mm-hmm. and I feel like more often than not, the response is, oh, that happened to me too. Mm. Wow, yeah. Every time, except once in a while, it's, oh, I know someone who has. But yeah. everyone has a story. story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're so surrounded so by surrounded. it too. If it's not us, it's somebody else that we know or mm-hmm. close to. I know when we're going through our pregnancy journey, I've had friends who've lost, you know, seven babies and one stillborn. Um, and then, you know, at what point? So my question is actually because... When I was going through the in vitro and with everything that my body had to go through, when we went in um, to do the procedure, I said, I'm like, this is it. I already made up my mind. We talked with Lee about it. I said, if this doesn't work, I am done. I am emotionally exhausted. Physically, I am exhausted. Because again, it's those, those same kind of emotions when you're trying to get pregnant why can't I have a baby? What's wrong with me? What am I doing? Like, I, I'm a woman. I meant to do this and I can't even do that. Like, what kind of woman I am? Like, that, you know, and then you start questioning, Are he, is he going to be okay not having children? He says he's going to be okay, but we've had those difficult conversations and I did give him an out. I said, listen, I know children, you know, are important. And if you want children... It might not have to be, like, it might not be with me, right? So I, I, we, I had to have those tough, tough conversations. Um, and then, yeah, when we went in for the procedure, I was lucky that I only took one and we got, you know, pregnant uh, with the triplets. And then early on, we, we knew the baby just as a heartbeat. And it's so crazy because my children, they never talk, like, we never talked about it. Uh, Kaylee is a lot more sensitive than uh, Kasia in that aspect of like sensing things. And she's like, out of the blue, she's like, mommy, I miss my brother. I was like, "Mm -hmm." right. So um, yeah, so we kind of feel like, you know, it was, yeah, yeah, the two 
too. And it's funny because we went to a psychic and she said, you're going to have three children, two girls and one boy. Mm. And as soon as she said, I miss my brother, mommy. You know, it's, um, it, it just, yeah. Yeah. It's stuck. That's like, holy man, there, you know, it, it is not just like you said, like cells or whatever. It, it's a being. Now I'm going <laughs> to <laughs> need some Kleenex. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, so yeah, but yeah, um, I heard, you know, people, ladies in there, um, that they were going in for like the eighth in vitro and they haven't had a baby. So at what point do you say, I've had enough, right? Like, yeah, and I don't know. I mean, yeah. it's scary because we def we took a break after this last one because mm -hmm. I it was so similar timing for last year that I was mm -hmm. like, I don't. It's weird because now I'm thinking in terms of what if I have a miscarriage, which mm -hmm. I never thought before. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, well, if we have a miscarriage, I don't want to go through the holidays like that again, like last year. Mm -hmm. And so I'm planning for a possible loss instead mm -hmm. of. I never, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we are taking a break for now. Um, and I knew, I felt like if we, if I'd gone through a loss that quick again, I, I was like, I might have to go to an insane asylum. Like I, mm -hmm. I, right. I thought I was going to lose my desire for life. And I have, I'm grateful to say we have our, our son and, mm -hmm. and I love my husband and I love my family. And so I would not ever give up. You don't have to worry about me, but I just felt like I didn't have it in me to do it again. Mm -hmm. And so this time has been very healing. I have high hopes for, um, you know, when we do start trying, our fertility doctor is going to put a, going to put me on uh, progesterone. Mm -hmm. I've heard good things about that. I'm also back on my thyroid, which I've been on it my entire life. Went off of it to a couple of years ago because I've been on such a low dose that the doctors thought it would be fine. And that I think that could be my missing link. Mm -hmm. Although the doctors don't because it's such a small amount, but mm -hmm. whatever. Well, natural paths well, like I you know. have a higher level. So right? there you go. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I feel like I have, you know, I, do, I want to brace myself for who knows what, but I have high hopes that mm -hmm. um, we'll have better luck. At the same time, the fertility doctor did talk to us this last call about, you know, if I get, if we get to our breaking point, then there is IVF and what that would look like. And it would mm -hmm. just condense a lot of possible losses and they'd be able to sort through it. So getting my head wrapped around mm -hmm. that, um, you know, I don't know. It's a big question mm -hmm. mark. I, I'm i still in that, like, I want to, I want this next one to work. So I want that possibility mm -hmm. to be what I focus on, but also, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I feel like we would probably, you know, maybe one or two more and then maybe go to IVF. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Oh man, there's so many things to talk about. I don't know where to go next. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking about what you said about, I just want to circle back. Like to, it is so true that, you know, you, you like you said before, you didn't want to be part of a club that you're now a part of. But I just think it's, it's great that you're talking about all this. And the fact that I really, I, I know like, I feel like I don't know you that well but I, re I remember seeing you like around right after that forest fire time and you come back I think you were doing a brief talk at the chic retreat and I could just see what you're saying that like the spark had just like left you know when you then we did that for t that run together the mm -hmm. you know the BC butterfly run and I remember thinking like oh man like you're just feeling for you and everything you're going through and then seeing that, you know, you went away and I could see in these pictures that you're taking that you were getting some of that spark back and you, you know, like you must have found some healing there is what it looked like from the outside. And I just wondered if you had sort of some advice to women going through these kind of losses to maybe, like you said, you took a pause, you got some of your it seems from an outsider, you have a bit more of your joie de vivre for the lack of better <laughs> sense of the word back. And it's it's nice to see that spark in your eye. But yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I um thank you for yeah, for recognizing that. And you know, as much as I spent my younger years trying to pretend like everything was always perfect and I always had things figured out, I do think it's important to you know, now I'm trying to be just more authentic of what's real. And so, yeah, thank you for seeing me and for showing up to that race. That meant so much to that run for pregnancy loss. Um, 
You know, I don't know that I have any specific real advice because I'm figuring it out as I go. Mm -hmm. But what I will say is it's so important to listen to yourself, to your Mm -hmm. body, to what every individual needs in that moment and that it, and to give ourselves grace because it is hard. There's hormones involved. There's, you know, the attachment to something, the idea of what's, what's becoming and the desire for family to look a certain way, be a certain way, or that feeling like someone might be missing, you Mm -hmm. know, and all these things that are so hard to talk about or put words to. And so it's a process. So I, so I think for me, it's just been giving myself grace to be in it, to Mm -hmm. feel it, to be angry, to be confused, to be scared, um, you know, to go back and be talking about the experiences because those were very traumatizing Mm -hmm. And, and to honor that, you know, and it's different for everybody. I recognize for everyone, it may not be traumatizing. It Mm -hmm. may just be something they can skirt past or process quickly. And for others, it might be bigger. So everyone, everyone's different. And, you know, that's actually something I want to touch on. I do feel is important is this feeling of comparison, which Mm -hmm. happens in any, in all areas, a lot of areas of life. Mm -hmm. I did not expect for myself to feel it in this. And it is a thing. Like when I hear I have two friends who gave birth to stillborns this last year Mm -hmm. at 20 something weeks. And I've heard, you know, more stories now of people giving birth at 30 something weeks. And then I go into, well, who am I Mm -hmm. to have these depths of feelings and sadness and grief around some, you know, something that was not fully formed into a, you know, and all the things, all the stories. And then the other comparison when I've been even on the grief uh, support calls and we've talked about it, Mm -hmm. but having a living child, Mm -hmm. which I'm so grateful for, but not everyone does. Some people are having loss after loss after loss and they don't have a, a baby. They don't know if they'll be able to give birth. And so feeling guilty then that oh gosh, who am I to have this sadness when I have a human that I can care for? And these feelings are so unhelpful Mm -hmm. (laughs) when I'm at the same time dealing with my grief, you know, thinking about this process of conception still and, but honoring it, talking about it, recognizing that it's real. And I I do want to talk about it in case other people are noticing that and Mm -hmm. what the the leader of therapist, I think she is on the group thought group calls. She keeps reminding us, and I will say it here, is that everyone's story matters Mm -hmm. and that everyone's feelings are valid and that in every area, like not comparing ourselves Mm -hmm. because whatever we're feeling is real. Mm -hmm. And if we start to compare ourselves, then we're invalidating ourselves, which Mm -hmm. then does not honor the space or allow us to move through it. So mm-hmm. really honoring that our feelings are valid, giving ourselves space to do whatever is necessary to get through it. Uh, and it's different for everyone. Some people might want to journal. Some people might want to um, read. Some people might have a little extra wine, you know, as long as we're not hurting anybody, uh, whatever it is. I also found spin classes was therapeutic for me mm-hmm. and I had no idea, but I went to a local spin class in town. I went to Pace and they have all the lights off for part of it. And the music was so loud. And I, the the um, instructors are so inspiring and they'd be saying something and I would just start bawling. And I loved it because no one could hear me or see me. Nice. And I would just be on, I'd be on the bike, just like going for it and just the tears rolling. Mm-hmm. And it, it was actually part of my therapy. Mm-hmm. I don't cry and spin anymore. I'm not proud to <laughs> there say. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> it worked. Right. But I, I mean, I think finding back to your question, I think finding what whatever is needed to process the emotions and also reaching out to people because mm-hmm. I do think people want to be there for support. Mm-hmm. And I think what you're saying is such an important point about, I know Lee Pico is always saying that you can't <laughs> measure grief on a measuring stick, right? Mm -hmm. Like everybody's experience is individual and you, you are grieving and you are feeling your feelings and all those feelings are value are valid. valid, Sorry. not. But uh, I wish, like, I hope there comes a time when we all like realize that about life, right? Like any feeling someone's Mm -hmm. having is a feeling they're having. It's valid. 
Loss is loss and yeah. we, we we process it differently. Everybody processes loss differently because it's not something that is trainable. It's your feelings, it's your emotions, it's your core mm-hmm. that comes out during those times of, you know, loss and sadness. Um, it's like, you know, with my mom, she does that all the time. My Well, I have a therapist and, you know, I've been working with her and she's amazing in holding that space and allowing the emotions just to come. Um, although I am pierced the resistance a lot of the time. <laughs> The resistance is real because, you know, I am afraid to feel those feelings because it's easier for me just to shove shove them down, down, Mm -hmm. right? But then I hear my mom um, talking about, you know, the loss of my dad. And she says, well, you know, someone's husband died when they were 45 and dad was 65, right? So she still feels it's unfair. He had so much time. But then she convinces herself that her loss is not as bad as those, let's say, who lost a child because we do have a cousin who was killed in a car accident when she was 20. So then it's her brother's only daughter. So then, yeah, she was, you know, comparing to that, you know, she's like, that would be worse. I'm like, well, you can't, mom, you need to feel it and process Mm -hmm. it and allow it to come in without comparing your loss, our loss to everybody else's. So, and then circling back, talking about it I mean when my cousin passed we did not know it was such a shock we did not know what to do and how to deal with it so we just stopped talking about it which was the worst thing we could have done for my auntie and uncle because that means we we didn't care but we cared so much we just didn't know how to talk about it because we're not taught you know, how to hold space, how to deal with, you know, those unsolicited advice and, Mm -hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff. We, when you don't know, you just don't know. We know now it was the worst thing we could have done as a family, just stop talking about it. We talk about it a lot. We've, we've realized years ago, this was a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And it's the same, you know, when you lose a, a baby, it doesn't matter. To me, a baby's a baby. When the, the day it conceives, it's, it's a baby. Um, you know, so dealing with that, talking about it, it's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, just to hold that space. They aren't good. Oh, <laughs> the <cleaners. laughs> and I remember having this conversation once with um a bunch of friends and we were talking about pregnancy loss and we were talking about um and I remember having a conversation with someone about like I don't know if you ever did this, but like for one of my pregnancies, the first one, like I had a name that we were like in agreement. This is what the, and I still, and like, that's the baby's name and never used it again. We never, ever considered using that name because we both felt like, no, that was that baby. And I remember talking to someone else who was there and was like, oh, I have a name like that too. And, and the other person who had never had a pregnancy loss was just like, oh, that's so weird. But it's so true. Like, as soon as a baby's conceived, you like you said, you dream of, you think of it in your family's mm-hmm. life. You visualize what it's going to be like. Mm-hmm. So, so, yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah. And then you feel it. Not yeah. only for me, it was a huge realization because it wasn't just me and my husband and my family that felt it. My, my children felt it too. Mm-hmm. Right. So that was a huge eye opener that they've also carried that there was another life within my womb with them. Right. So yeah. it's just so crazy. And they talk about that, I guess, too. Like yeah. Evie has said to me before, like, did you know Kate and Kaylee had a brother? And yeah, they, like she oh. processes it. They obviously yeah. talk about it, which yeah. is cool too. Yeah. Beautiful. And refer, going back to something you said about people just we're not taught how mm-hmm. to talk about grief and process it and be there for people. And I think you know, there's two things that I've learned in this process that can help because you're right. People sometimes just don't know what to say Mm -hmm. or if they should say anything because some people do want to talk about it. Others don't. And how do we know? You know, by asking. Mm -hmm. And I think we forget that it's okay to ask. My best friend in Vancouver, she, and actually my mom did this too. I really appreciate it. They said, how can I support you? What do you need from me? Mm-hmm. What do you, like, do you want to talk about it? Would you not want to talk about it? And I said, thank you so much for that question because I had to think about it. And I said, yes, I do want to talk about it. You can ask me anytime, all the time. I want to talk about it. I need to talk about it. I have this desire to 
talk about it. I don't want it to be something that just goes away because mm-hmm. it's something I've lived through and I'm still living through. And that meant a lot to me. And I think if people can just take that when they know that someone is going through something and don't, maybe they don't know what to say or if they say anything, either just asking, mm-hmm. you know, what can I do? What do you need from me? And then the other one is just a simple thinking of you mm-hmm. or even being honest. I don't know what to say, but I want you to know I'm thinking of you. And that can go a very, very long mm-hmm. way as well. Because sometimes in the end, that's just what we want is to know that mm-hmm. people are have us in, in their hearts. Yeah, totally. I know uh, my new motto is like, to always say something when someone's grieving, whatever it is, mm-hmm. like just even a thinking of you, like you're saying, one of my biggest re- regrets, I guess, or thing I feel badly about is that in my 20s, one of my friend's dads died. And I just, like, I just said nothing. I didn't know what to say. And I said nothing. And when your dad died, Bella, it made me think of her. And I thought, oh my God, saying something is better than nothing. So I actually reached out to her and I said, listen, I didn't know what to say in my 20s. And I wish I had said something to you because I was thinking about you and I'm I feel like I should have said something and I didn't know what to say but I now have learned like saying nothing is better than nothing and she was like thank you so much for saying that and I don't know it's just like it's hard you just got to say something thinking of you anything Mm -hmm. beautiful that you circled back and I bet that meant so much to her I hope so yeah yeah no it is it's important because I felt also isolated. Not only my cousin passed away, but then my friends didn't know what to say. So then they isolated me as well because I was grieving. So then nobody reached out, nobody said anything. And it, it was just, I felt so alone. And I I felt like, uh, like they've abandoned me, mm. right? So yeah, I do agree. Like say something. Um, don't say, oh, it's fine. You'll right. do it, <laughs> you know, whatever, you know. Is, you'll have another like this is the worst thing that it's was the- going to be one of my questions like some of the worst uh responses like not to shame anybody but that people do say without even thinking like oh it'll yeah. be fine or- so this is actually a big topic that has come up recently in the group therapy um the pregnancy loss therapy that i'm part of because last week was on communication and they did talk about a lot of the things and there and you see i've come across posts and whatnot of all the hurtful things that can be said Mm -hmm. and one of the girls stepped up and said you know what i wish someone would say at least one of those things to me because at least it shows that they care Mm -hmm. because she feels even more isolated because people kind of probably similar to you, stopped talking about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is, there. there's always a different perspective on things. And while, yes, I could list at least five or 10 things that the don't say because it doesn't make people feel good. But at the same time, if we can have the perspective of people, where they're coming from, maybe not the words that they're saying, but where Mm -hmm. they're coming from, if it's from a good place and it's from a heartfelt place and they they're trying to offer sympathy, but just maybe aren't saying the right thing. Mm -hmm. Having just compassion for people who are just showing that they care. And I think if we can Mm -hmm. just let go of the actual words and just sink into the feeling, then also that'll prevent people from being quiet about it because maybe they're not saying anything because they don't want to say the wrong thing. Right. Right? So we're kind of perpetuating that. But, But at the same time, there are some things that, you know, of course can Mm -hmm. be hurtful. So I think if people can just try to come from their heart and, and Mm -hmm. go back to that. Like, I don't know what to say. I just want you to know I'm here for you. I'm thinking Mm -hmm. of you. Please let me know if you need anything. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think if it comes from that kind of space, that's, yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. Where you're asking without telling. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. It's like the worst thing that my auntie (laughs) heard was because she had her daughter at 16 and um, Kate actually is her mm-hmm. Kasia. I named my child after my cousin. I promised her that my firstborn would be named after her. And I did that. Uh, but she, she was like, so she had Kasia at 16. So when Kate died at 20, she was still young. And, and, you know, people were like, you're still young. You can make another, like how oh, crazy, yeah. like you cannot replace a life. In it with a with a life like you just said you can especially when you yeah. had somebody for twenty years, right? So, um, yeah, coming from that space of how can I be of service? How can I help you? What do you need? Let me know. Do you need me just to hold space? Sometimes that's all you need is 
somebody to sit with you while yes. you cry and hold space and say nothing. Yeah. I have a bottle of wine, your place or mine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or that yeah. one or ice cream or or uh, pickles. Or, yeah, or pickles. <laughs> yeah. Which, which one cream? will it be? Yeah. I'll yeah. be over in 10. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, and I guess mm. one other thing I was going to say was, I know we, do we have to wrap up? Is that yeah. what you're about to say? It? <laughs> um, was, yeah, one thing that used to kind of rile me up is because I had this, and I don't know if you had this, but I had a real clear idea that I wanted my kids to be two years apart and they obviously are four years apart, so they're not. But something that used to bother me that people would say, and it's reminding me of your mindset shift here, is it used to be bother me when people would say, oh, that's a huge age gap or, oh, that's a lot of years, right? And it really annoyed me. And then I realized, well okay, I used to have that same perspective too. So then now what I say is I'm like, yeah, it really is. You know what? It took a long time, a lot longer for me to get pregnant the second time than I thought it would. And then it's just like, it makes people think because I also used to do that as well. I think, oh, why would you ever want your kids five years apart? That's, but you never know someone's story or Mm -hmm. why their kids are five years apart, 10 years apart, whatever, right? So yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah okay. And I love that you answered with uh, your honest story, which brings that stigma away, right? Yes. When we can just be truthful and you're not in a threatening way. You're not saying no, like, yeah. shut the... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. which no. is what I probably <laughs> wanted to say in the beginning, yeah. but, but I got over that. But yeah. you're saying the truth and then that brings more awareness, which is mm-hmm. exactly what this call, this podcast is about. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Um, and I do, before we wrap, yes. wanted to do a shout out to Butterfly Run BC. So if anyone is looking for resources or wanting to know more about what's out there, Butterfly Run BC has been my go-to. Um, it's an Instagram account. They also have a website. I think it's butterflyrunbc.ca. And um, there's free groups, um, online groups, and they're doing more in-person groups all over BC for um, infant loss, pregnancy loss, infertility, all the things. So find them, plug in and... I hope that they can, yeah, help more people because they're doing great work. Mm. Well, thank you so, so, so much for coming and sharing Mm -hmm. your journey with us. Um, Yeah, it is so important to, you know, I feel like talk about it in real, raw and unfiltered way so we can be there to support each other, to work through things and just hold space. Because us women go through a lot of shit. I know, right? You know, and so, alone often. <laughs> alone. Yeah. So let's not do it alone. Let's do it together because we are stronger and better together. So yeah. Thank with you. that, till next time. Till next time. Bye. 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 We hope you enjoyed today's episode and that you feel more empowered, moved, and inspired. Be sure to check out the show's description and follow us on social media at Let's Not Sugarcoat It podcast on both Instagram and Facebook. Also, check out our YouTube channel where you can view and subscribe to our latest episodes. What you have to say matters, so send us your feedback and ideas on what you'd like us to talk about so we can serve you better. And remember, motherhood is a team sport. 